from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, folks. My name is Norman Middleton. I'm one of the concert producers here at the library. And uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Stephen Brown tonight. But before I do, uh, just a couple of announcements. On February 3rd, the uh, symposium uh, uh, Depression and Creativity will be up on the library's website, hopefully by next week. So uh, just keep looking, and it'll be there eventually. Also, uh, if you could please turn off your cell phones and pagers, because uh, we're on candid camera. So, uh, Stephen Brown is one of the world's experts on the neuroscience of the arts. He is the director of the Neuro Arts Lab at McMaster University in Ontario, which is devoted to studying the neural, cognitive, and evolutionary foundations of the arts. The research there focuses in part on the mechanisms of emotion in both the creation and apprehension of the arts. And the lab has a strong interest in comparative musicological studies related to the evolution of the geography and cultural evolution of the world's musical styles. Dr. Brown is the editor of two recent influential collections of essays, The Origins of Music, and music and manipulation from the social uses and social control of music. Here it is, good book. I've read it, it's good. <laughs> the title of his lecture tonight is From Mode to Emotion in Musical Communication. So without further ado, Dr. Stephen Brown. Okay, thanks Norman. Um, thanks for the invitation to come here. It's a pleasure to be here. I see so many people in the audience. Can you turn me up just a little bit, please? Okay, thanks. Um, even though I'm a brain researcher, I'm not going to talk about the brain tonight. I'm going to talk about music and emotion, but more from a cognitive psychological perspective than from a neuroscientific perspective. When I talk to the general public, they always ask me about musical emotion, so I decided just to make my talk about musical emotion tonight. So it's going to be sort of psychological, cognitive. I won't talk about the brain at all. Um, but if you have questions, I can answer questions afterwards about neural aspects. So I just want to talk about uh, the psychology of emotion. And so there was, there's been a long debate about the nature of emotion and psychology. And I won't go into it right now, but basically most people agree now that emotions are about something. That emotions involve um, a kind of appraisal of things. Oh, this, uh, that wasn't one of my jokes though. Okay. <laughs> um, Emotions are about something. So they involve an appraisal. Um, they're situational. They're induced by particular experiences or objects. And so they're based on making some kind of evaluation. Is this thing good for me, bad for me? Some kind of evaluation about the, the meaning, the importance of something for you. This is in contrast to moods. I guess you're going to be talking about depression. You'll talk about moods uh, later on. These tend to be sort of objectless affective states. So an emotion sort of has a, a stimulus, an object that you can attach um, your evaluation to. Moods are a bit more amorphous and objectless. I won't, I won't talk about moods. I'm going to talk about emotion um, in this lecture tonight. So I just want to introduce sort of a few technical terms here, but the three basic dimensions of emotion according to cognitive psychologists. And these are valence, intensity, and focus. And so valence is the sense to which the, music, the, the emotion feels good or bad. And so most emotions feel either good or bad, not both, not neither. And so this is sort of, a, I say, a binary distinction. Um, most emotions have sort of a good for me or a bad for me feeling. And we call that property the valence of the emotion. Intensity, as you might imagine, is about how, how intense the emotion feels. So you can be glad, you can be ecstatic. You can be annoyed, you can be in a rage. Okay, so emotions vary um, in gradation, you know, from low intensity to high intensity. And so while this valence is sort of all or nothing, one or the other, um, intensity is more graded. It's more of a continuum from, from low to high. Then the last feature, which is focus or quality, is sort of what the emotions are about, what kinds of appraisals are involved. And I'll talk about two different schemes for, for focus. Now, 
if you've taken a course in psychology or biology, you've learned about sort of the dominant theory of emotion, which actually goes back to Charles Darwin, and is called the basic emotion theory. And that's the idea that there are a handful of, of really fundamental, biologically uh, based emotions, and typically in these schemes there are somewhere between five or ten of these basic emotions. What's shown on this slide are some of, some of the, the big ones, um, such as anger, sadness, happiness, fear, um, disgust, surprise, contempt. Like I said, these schemes tend to have between five and ten of these basic emotions. And even though Darwin proposed this theory in the 19th century, it was sort of revived in the, in the 1970s. And a lot of the work was based on looking at facial expressions. And so if you show these kinds of pictures to people from non-Western cultures, they'll make the same kinds of emotional interpretations that this is a sad face, um, this is a happy face. And so some like cross-cultural universals in people's um, interpretations of these things. Um, so again, this is a standard model that you learn about in psychology or biology courses. And me personally, I've always had a lot of problems with it. And so let me tell you some of the, I think, basic problems with the basic emotion theory. Um, it tends to be sort of unidimensional, and so people don't talk so much about the valence and intensity aspects. So it just tends to be sort of these five or six categories of emotion. But also, psychologists who sort of enumerate or catalog human emotions come up with numbers like many, many hundreds, 700, 800, maybe a thousand different kinds of emotions. And so talking about five or 10 basic ones, even though they may actually be very fundamental, it really underestimates kind of the richness of human emotions. So I don't doubt for a second that these things are very fundamental and basic, but they, they don't encompass all of our emotions. There are actually many hundreds according to psychologists of emotion. Next, the theory has been very face-oriented, and so most of the evidence for or against it has been based on looking at facial expressions cross-culturally. Someone like me who thinks about music, I think much more about sound and the voice and less about the face. And so people in the basic emotion camp haven't really talked about emotions in the voice or in body gesture. It's all been very much based on face and facial expression. So it's been a bit limited in terms of the kind of evidence that's used to support it. And then lastly, um, for a long time in psychology, there was a real dichotomy between cognition and that there's emotion and the two are very separate and these days the two are coming together and I think the basic emotion theory hasn't really come to terms with the, with the fact that emotion has a big influence on cognition and so for a long time I was trying to think about alternative theories to this one I came up with some of my own ideas but then I discovered another theory from some American psychologists which kind of encompassed my own ideas and went even further and so I've kind of adopted um, the model of these two psychologists, Gerald Clore and Andrew Ortney. And so I just want to introduce that and then apply this to the arts and ultimately to emotion and music. And so for them, yeah, they think about, they think about valence, they think about intensity, but in terms of focus, they talk about there are three different basic kinds of appraisals that we make as far as categories of emotion. And so it's these three here, um, outcomes of events, aspects of objects, and actions of agents. So I'll just go through the three just to give you some sense of what these things are. So the first one deals with the fact that we have motivations and goals. If our goals are met, we feel sort of positive outcome emotions. We feel happy, we feel pleased. If our goals are somehow thwarted, we feel a negative outcome emotion, we feel um, displeased. Since I teach, most of my students don't have cars. I talk about catching the bus. So if you, you, know, if you want to catch the bus, the bus is just about to leave, and you're running towards it. If it pulls off before you get there, you're going to feel anger, frustration, whatever. If the bus driver waits for you, you're going to feel pleased. So this is a category of emotions that are based on appraisals. You have these goals. If your goals are met, you feel this positive outcome emotion. If they're not, you feel a negative feeling like frustration. That's one kind of appraisal. <coughs> Another kind is your appraisal of the properties of objects. And so certain objects, certain foods, music that you like, elicit these kind of positive let's call them aesthetic emotions, a sense of attraction or liking. Other things have the opposite kind of thing. You feel a sense of repulsion or disgust or dislike. And these are different kinds of emotions than these kinds of outcome things. But this, this category generally can be thought of as your aesthetic emotions, having a sense of, on the one hand, attraction for things that you find pleasing or a sense of dislike or repulsion for things that you don't, you don't like. Um, so those are sort of the object emotions. Then the last category deals with the actions of agents. And these are kind of the, the moral emotions. So if you look at the behavior of people, in some cases you feel a sense of approval, you may feel a sense of pride for a friend who accomplishes something, or you may feel a sense of, of repugnance, disapproval for, for other kinds of things. And so this, this is the third category based on the actions of agents. These could be thought of as our moral emotions. So just, just briefly, uh, these are some common <coughs> everyday emotions from these three categories. So for outcomes, your, your goal-motivated emotions, happiness, contentedness, 
compared with frustration, anger, and anxiety. Uh, for your object, aesthetic emotions, things like you feel liking, attraction, ecstasy, in contrast to dislike, repulsion, and disgust. And then for the agency category, feelings of pride and approval compared to indignance and disgust. People who've studied disgust find that the two things that people find most disgusting are feces and politicians, okay? <laughs> so, um, but the, the point is if that those are two different kinds of disgust because the, the feces, the feces is this, is this category, but the politicians is this category. I just gave a talk in, in Ontario um, about aesthetics and I put up a picture of our prime minister, Stephen Harper, and I said, how many people think Stephen Harper is handsome? And 300 people were there, no one, <laughs> nobody raised their hand. And he's actually he's a nice looking guy, but people think he's unattractive, not because he's unattractive facially, but because they disapprove of him as a politician. And so these two things tend to get mixed together, but these are feces, uh, this is Stephen Harper here, okay? And so it's a different kind of disgust that you feel for people and for things like feces and vomit and all that, just to clarify. So let me try and apply these ideas about this cognitive notion of emotion to, to the arts. And I just want to kind of use a very simple kind of a scheme. So here's a kind of a basic question that we ask in cognitive psychology of the arts. To what extent do artworks induce emotion in perceivers versus do they simply represent emotion? This is actually a very important question that we think about in the arts. So do we just, do actually, do we elicit emotion or do we just simply represent emotion in artworks? And so I want to make this, con I'm going to use color coding in the next few slides to kind of make this contrast. So when I, when I talk about red, when I show red, it's going to be induced emotions. The emotion that a person feels when listening to, for example, music. These are true emotions, okay? So if you listen to a piece of music and you have a certain emotional response, that's going to be an induced emotion. Those are real emotions. In green, I'll talk about represented emotions. The emotion that the music expresses, the emotional content of a piece of music. These are not emotions. These are cognitive representations of emotions. So when we talk about people, people experience emotions, but pieces of music are not emotions. They, they represent emotion in some way, but they're not themselves emotions. They're the representations of emotion. So let me just show a very simple scheme that I present to my students um, in classes. So artworks, we feel, are expressive of, of emotion. In other words, artists express or communicate emotion through artworks, hence perceivers, like say us tonight at the concert, um, of these artworks have to recognize these emotions for the impact of the work to be realized. So artists, you know, composers, uh, performers, they imbue the artwork with a certain emotional quality and we have to somehow decode this and interpret what the person means um, with their expression. When an artwork is most appreciated, the emotionally expressive character of the work elicits positive aesthetic responses. This category, the Clor and Ortney called aspects of objects. And so sometimes uh, works have no particular impact on us, but when they, when they really work for us, we're gonna have this kind of positive um, emotional response that we're going, we're going to feel at its best. We can also have naked, we can also feel repulsion, you know, have a sense we don't like it, but when it really works, we're gonna feel a positive aesthetic response when we, when we experience it. The emotion expressed in the artwork can sometimes induce the same emotion in the perceiver. This process is called empathy. For example, a sad sounding piece of music can make a person sometimes feel sad. But in general, that's not the case. In most cases, we interpret the sound, the emotion in a virtual manner. And so we don't actually feel the emotion, we simply recognize the emotion. And so I'm sure you've had the experience uh, you know, you listen to music and you can say, oh, that's really happy music, but you don't feel happiness, or it's, it's, you say, it sounds very sad, but you don't actually feel the sadness. You simply have a system that recognizes the emotional content. Um, the induction part may or may not follow. In most cases, it doesn't. Okay, so I want to make this distinction between recognizing the emotional content of the piece versus your actual response, which may not follow that in general. Finally, um, artworks are also moral objects. You can also have this sense of, of a moral appraisal. I mean, for example, I mean, when I, when I watch television, I, mean, I have a very bad relationship with television, and so it's not just that I watch the shows and say, you know, yuck, you know, it's terrible. I say to myself, who the hell is responsible for this? You know, I have this kind of this moral indignance. It's not just that they're aesthetically really repulsive, but it's like, who's behind all, all this stuff on TV? So we have all some moral responses um, to what we see in the arts. Um, so a lot of work looking at uh, musical emotion shows that music is actually not a very good inducer of emotion as shown here. The basic response we have 
um, in listening to music is an aesthetic one. We feel a sense of, of liking, disliking. It can be very intense. We have you know, very strong experiences. We feel chills. We can cry. We feel moved, whatever transcendence. But in general, that's the major emotional response to something like music, and not so much the, indu the empathic induction of that same emotion. That can occur too, but that's much less common than simply having a very strong aesthetic response to what we hear. Okay, so now I want to talk about, so what can music express? And so if you look at the other art forms, like theater and dance and the visual arts, in terms of the three kinds of emotions, the three categories I talked about, I think they're all fairly effective at expressing all the three categories, so outcome emotions and aesthetic emotions and moral emotions. And they do so, say in the case of theater, using language, uh, gesture, facial expression. Even in the absence of language, I think using facial expression and postures are good enough to convey a lot of these, all these categories of emotion. But what about music? And so people have debated for a long time, what does music express? What can it express? And so I'll just give you my take on this, and there's a lot of literature, especially from philosophers, on what music can express. And so people ask, you know, can music really convey a sense of, of embarrassment and jealousy? And so I'm one of those people who says, no, it can't express um, shame and pride. For me, music is very good at this spectrum here about happy and sad. So what, I, what I'm calling outcome emotions, like being happy, being sad, being pleased. I think music is very good at expressing that spectrum of emotion. As far as the last category, shame and pride, embarrassment, uh, I think I agree with other people that music is not very good at expressing things like, like jealousy and all that. As far as the second category, as far as representing beauty, in general, music tries to be beautiful to represent beauty. So for example, in Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet, you have the Juliet theme. So Prokofiev tries to write a very beautiful theme to represent a beautiful subject, which is Juliet. So I think music can represent beauty by sort of embodying it, by being beautiful. Um, so that's kind of my take, and I'll, I'll take that a bit further later on in the talk, but that music is kind of exclusively devoted to expressing sort of one category of emotions, these outcome emotions about happiness and sadness and things like that, and not the other categories um, of emotion. So to say this uh, in other words, um, that music works by representing a general sense of sort of goodness, badness, um, like positivity, negativity, um, with whatever it's associated um, with. And so, I think, so briefly stated, uh, music is a prostitute. And I think this is maybe the, the best thing, the, the truest thing I can say about music. And I just, I just had this um, podcast thing uh, before this, this talk, and I spoke about this with uh, Steve. What's his name, Steve? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, and actually, so the book that Norman was, was talking about, this music and manipulation. So the major uses of music are sort of non-musical. Music becomes associated with everything under the sun. We see it all around us. Uh, TV commercials and restaurants, religion and all that. I mean, music is there to sort of prop up other things. And so we have certain musical devices that things, you know, positive versus negative sounds. And music can reinforce other kinds of messages. And so um, music is a prostitute. And I like to tell the story that when I was working on this book, I was living in, in Stockholm in Sweden in those days, there was lots of discussion in the media about the rise of neo-Nazi um, what they call white noise music. And because I was working on this book, I really felt that I had to know something about this music. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, it was, it was illegal to purchase it in Sweden, so it, it was kind of risky for me to actually get it, and I, I realized now was I could have been deported and all that. But anyways, it was, I went to an American website um, in New Jersey and decided to purchase the stuff online. And I gotta say, the people were very, very nice. The Nazis were very, very friendly, very, very customer friendly. <laughs> um, now because I said, you know, I'm really worried about, you know, getting caught, the immigration, they say, you know, we, we pride ourselves on, you know, customer satisfaction, and uh, we have very discreet packaging, you know, don't worry about this. What, what's, what's the point of all this? So, uh, you know, I got, I got the, the stuff, and, you know, the, the content is just so vile. I mean, it's really, it's horrible stuff. But if you listen to the music, the music sounds very, very similar to the music you're going to hear tonight by, by Schubert. It's the same chord sequences you find in typical Western classical music. So it's not that there are sort of, you know, there's evil music and good music. There are evil associations and evil uses of music, but the music itself is rather neutral and very much, to me, a prostitute. It can kind of go wherever you want it to go and reinforce whatever message you want to get reinforced. And so I, I like this quote. It's not sort of a very pretty quote, but I think it's kind of the truest thing that we can say about the social uses of music. So let's talk about how music does what it does. Um, and so I want to talk about 
I'm just going to focus now not on the induced emotions, but just talk about the representation of emotion in music, the emotional content. How does music convey these kinds of emotional things? And so I want to talk about sort of two different devices that music has. So I just want to, okay, I'm going to talk about sort of valence and intensity again, just to review the slide. Um, I want to talk about two different ways that music can do what it does. On the one hand, we have these, what I'm going to call just generalized arousal mechanisms that convey something about the intensity of emotion. And I'm going to argue this one is, is very generic. It's shared with other things like speech and gesture. It's not specific to music. But then music has kind of its own unique thing, and that's the use of different kinds of scales that convey different kinds of emotion. And so I'm going to use the word mode tonight in the kind of technical sense to refer to musical scales. They're often referred to as modes. And so it makes kind of a nice phrase here, mode, emotion. But the use of different kinds of scales to convey different kinds of emotion, and this will be a, a, a way to signal valence. Let me talk about these two in sequence. And so there's some general ways of conveying emotional arousal, and the three most basic ones are register, high or low pitch, tempo, slow to fast, and volume, soft to loud. And so, for example, happiness is associated with high pitch, so high register, fast tempos, and loud volumes. And sadness is associated with the reverse spectrum, so it's low, it's slow, it's soft. And a lot of research has shown that there are very similar emotional meanings, uh, uh, emotional profiles between music and speech. So if you think about happy speech, happy music, they have essentially the same profile. They're both kind of high and fast and, and loud. I mean, if you, you apply this to gesture, same kind of thing. A person on a game show <laughs> does this and they're screaming. And so when people are happy with their gesture, it's also kind of, it's high and it's fast and it's big compared to one that's depressed, and it's low, and it's slow, and it's soft. Okay, so these things are very general forms of expression. They're not specific to music. They, they transcend music. They apply to speech, probably to gesture as much. These are ways of signifying something about arousal, high arousal, low arousal. So this is one way that music is able to convey emotion, especially intensity, is through register, tempo, and volume. But then music has its own special, unique way of conveying emotion and that's through the use of different kinds of scale types. And so different emotional valences are associated with different scale types. This is music's most unique, domain-specific way of conveying emotion. And so the one that we all know about if we're Western musicians is the major versus minor difference. But you know, I teach uh, psychology of music and I go through essentially most of the world of music and there are lots of examples of this. The best case is, is the Indian classical music, the raga system, these are their scales. There are literally hundreds, hundreds of different ragas that you find in Indian classical music, and they all have particular emotional connotations. So some are for the morning, some are for the afternoon, some are for the wet season, some for the dry season. They have very strong emotional connotations, and if you look across cultures, they have different scale types that convey different kinds of emotional meanings. And so major minor is just one way of doing it, the one that we know best in our culture, but in many cultures, they have these contrastive scale types where different scales connote different kinds of emotional meanings. So think about this. So here we have happy versus sad in facial expression. We know from physiology it takes literally dozens of muscles to make this contrast between the happy face and the sad face. But think about this contrast if you happen to read music and know about major and minor. This, this contrast between the, the major third and minor third is totally trivial. In terms of muscular production, if I were singing this, it's a very, very small change that I have to make in my laryngeal muscles to sing one or the other. So this is, this is a really, really big deal. This one that we find in music is a small deal, but it leads to a really categorical change in the interpretation. So I just want to play sort of one example um, in each key. And you'll see, even though you're making, we're making a very, very small change, the interpretation as far as happy and sad is, is like as a night and day kind of change. Ideally, I would have taken one piece and then transposed it major to minor. I, didn't, I don't have that, so let's just listen to a piece that's in a major key and then a very similar kind of orchestration, but in a minor key. Okay, so again, in terms of these arousal factors, loudness and tempo, whatever, pretty much the same. All we really changed there was, was something about the scale, and it sounds dramatically different in terms of our interpretation of, of the emotion. Okay, so then to just sum up what I've said, the music has kind of two different mechanisms. One are these generalized arousal mechanisms, 
like, like uh, register and tempo and loudness, then it has this more specific mechanism um, for different scale types. And importantly, these two different mechanisms can be varied independently. For example, a piece in a major key can be played in a high arousal or in a low arousal way. Likewise, a piece in a minor key can be played either way. And so we can imagine kind of a little two by two matrix like this. So on one, on the one hand, we have sort of these uh, valence mechanisms, so major and minor, and then we have the arousal things here, so low and high arousal. So if we take a piece in a, in a major key and play it in a very you know, tender, low arousal way, it's gonna sound very tranquil, very sweet. If we play it um, in a high arousal way, it's gonna sound happy, maybe even sound very heroic, like we just accomplished something very good, like in the Beethoven, we feel very, we feel very heroic. On contrast, if we take the minor key, the, the negative valence, play it in a very low arousal way, it could sound soft, even sound a little bit sinister, depending on, on context. If then we play it in this kind of high arousal way, it can sound very tragic, like the second Beethoven example, even fearful. And so what I'd like to do, kind of I think it'll be my, my last thing, is, is play um, a few minutes from Hitchcock's Vertigo with music written by Bernard Herrmann and just kind of demonstrate my, my point about these two different mechanisms. So I'm gonna show um, two segments, two scenes, and let me just go through the musical analysis. So in the first scene, the tonality aspect is going to be major. So it's going to be sort of this happy, this, this positive valence. It's going to be a major key. In terms of the arousal mechanisms, it's all going to be very soft, very sweet. So it's going to be, uh, it's actually, this is very feminist. It's all about sort of the female character. So this representation is very much oriented towards sweet, feminine. At some point, there's kind of a, a big buildup in the orchestration that represents kind of a climax focused on the male and I think his kind of interest um, in the character. But basically it's all from this kind of positive emotion, major tonality, most of it is very soft, very sweet, and then there's one climax that represents kind of um, attraction um, on the part of the male character. Then we're gonna, okay, one thing I like about this segment, is there are no words, I picked a segment that has, so there's no language to kind of confound the interpretation here. It's all done without words, it's just kind of scenes um, without any kind of language. Then we switch to the second scene. And again, it's gonna be like the Beethoven. There's gonna be this kind of night and day switch in tonality. It's going to go, it's not, it's not minor, but kind of a chromatic tonality. But it now sounds very negative, very kind of mysterious. And so that's gonna be the biggest change, going from this kind of very positive, sort of happy thing, to now this kind of dark, um, chromatic kind of tonality. At some point in the segment, we're gonna have the return of the first theme. And it's gonna be kind of the sense of relief. We have all this, this mystery, negativity, and then, uh, the positive theme. We, we're going to feel this kind of happiness, the, the return of the major, the major key. Then it's going to go back to this kind of um, negative thing. In terms of the arousal factors, it's all very kind of subdued orchestration. It all sounds very sinister. So it's negative, but it's kind of low arousal, so it sounds very mysterious. It sounds very sinister. Okay, so I just want to show that these two things can be varied. They can be varied independently. Um, as I say here, they're kind of independent. So this is the analysis. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you about five minutes now from Vertigo. I want you to think about these, these factors, about tonality, about arousal factors, how they come to play with each other um, in these scenes. Okay, so I hope that example of <laughs> <laughs> You gotta rent it now to see what happens. No, I'm sure you've all seen Vertigo, come on, you've all seen Vertigo. Yeah, I know that. Okay, so just kinda to summarize my points and then I'll take, I'll take questions for 50 minutes, whatever. So. To summarize, um, as far as induction, so the major um, induced emotional response to music in general is an aesthetic response, not an induction of the expressed emotion. In terms of representation, music mainly expresses what I'm calling, what Clore and Ortney call outcome emotions along the spectrum uh, of happy and sad and that kind of emotion. And there seem to be two independent mechanisms of the emotional representation, these generic arousal factors like um, register, tempo, and loudness, and then these very specific, music-specific, what I call mode emotion factors related to different kinds of scale types that have different um, emotive connotations. That's kind of my story for tonight. If you want to ask questions, we can, yeah. Register and, and Sorry. you mentioned the, the three factors. And I would propose to you that there is actually a fourth. I think there's, yeah, I think there are more. Yeah, go ahead. For want of a better term, I'll call it punctuation. 
Okay, yeah, the articulation. Articulation, yep. sostenuto versus staccato, for example. Even yep. at the same tempo, the same pitch, everything else, you will emo ev evoke different reactions based on the punctu punctuation of the material. I agree. <laughs> I think I'm trying, I, I simplify for this kind of a talk. I think punk, uh, articulation is one. I think timbre is going to be, an, I think there are a lot of emotive connotations of orchestration and timbre. I was trying to just make it kind of simple and make a dichotomy between two factors. But I agree, when, actually when I teach this in the course, I do talk about articulation as, as a factor in this. But I think it's, it's a great point that you, you bring up. Can you um, speak to scientific tests of these notions and how strong is the evidence? Scientific tests of? Of the notions that you presented tonight. Okay, well, I presented <laughs> many notions, so uh, can you be more specific? Or? Well, actually, pi w uh, pick a central one and then um, and and address uh, scientific tests of, of, of that. Okay, um, I think the biggest one is the thing about induction of emotion. And so I think people assume that, you know, sad music is going to induce sadness. So that kind of thing has been pretty well studied. And so, in general, music can induce these emotions, but it's very weak at doing them. But music is very good at bringing about um, a, a aesthetic emotions. So the sense about liking and chills and you know all that kind of stuff. Music is much better at doing that than at inducing these empathic emotions. So there, there are a lot of studies looking at that. That music can, in, like happy music, can induce happiness, but it's a very small effect. But the biggest effect is this kind of um, aesthetic response in terms of this liking and all the physiological correlates that go like, you know, the, the chills and tears and, and, and all that. You want more? I mean, that, that's kind of the... Uh, well, how do they know that? Well, because they, they, they look, they, they ask people to rate, you know, their emotions after listening to pieces of different valence. And so th they'll definitely see an effect going in the right direction. So a sad piece is more likely to induce a sad response than a happy response. But it, again, it's a, it's, a small, it's a small effect compared to other kinds of elicitors of emotion. So... Well, Oh, say, say, say it again. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I got mixed up. Uh, these are just done. Which between the aesthetic emotion and the induced emotion experimentally? Yeah, because they're different kinds of ratings. So one okay. kind of rating is how much do you like it versus you know how sad. So they're they're kind of different dimensions of emotional ratings. So for the for the empathic stuff, it's a sad piece, and now rate your sadness as a result of listening to a sad piece. The other one is how much do you like it? How much are you attracted to it? And so there are different kinds of rating scales for the likingness, like pleasantness versus um, happiness, sadness. So they're, they're different scales for rating. Okay, thanks. So again, the, the effects for the empathic emotions, they're there, but they're, they're small. But the ones for the pleasantness, uh, like likingness, are much stronger effects in general, bigger effect sizes than what you get for the induced emotion. writing about uh, musical emotion um, didn't feature in your talk, like form and expectation, yeah. uh, uh, harmony and dissidence. Are well, you ignoring these because they, they pretty much can be used in any kind of music? Well, I mean, the harmony part is very much part of my, the modal part. I, I use scales as the example, but everything comes from the scales. So typically, in most musics, harmonies and melodies come from particular pitch sets. So if you talk about a scale, you're talking a lot about the tonal aspect but of, of the music. I, you know, the, 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 the odd dissonant chord, the suspension, yeah, no. that you, you would put that under the, the heading of mode, right? Okay, but I'm gonna ask you a question now. Yeah. So what kinds of emotions are, are you talking about for these kinds uh, of? Um, un uneasiness, uncertainty, okay. um, um, sort of challenging where you think you've been going? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I would think about it more as like a global, local thing. So for example, listening to the Beethoven, it was globally in C major, so we had this kind of global emotional response. Then, uh, yeah, I agree, things happen in terms of musical form. We have these local suspensions of expectation, whatever. So I think it's all part of the same thing. It's just playing at different levels. But we have sort of like the scale kind of establishes a global feeling for the emotional tone. Then intrinsic to different elements, we have cadences, whatever, we play with it. But I think it's all part of the same thing with tonality. Um, but yeah, no, this was a kind of a, a coarse-grained analysis that I presented. But I think it's sort of the tonal aspect that is your May addressing. I ask one, of one other question? Yeah. Uh, often our reaction to pieces of music uh, 
are, is modified by extrasonic factors. We know that this was you know, written in Mozart's difficult last year or this, this stands as the summation of Schubert's you know, life vision. W w would you feel, how, how, how do these kind of emotions fit in with what you've been talking about? I think the first part when I talked about the prostitute <laughs> aspect, <coughs> just about everything about music is extra musical. I mean, I think we have a few mechanisms here. We talk about tonality, but just about everything of our experience is really, as you're saying, moderated by, you know, the context and the con. You know, there, there's so many other things. So there's very little actually about the music that probably comes into play in, in our f feeling about it. So a lot of it is about extra musical things and social aspects. Okay. And you know, like as I said during my podcast thing that. We're so accustomed to thinking about music for its own sake, but that's not the way most music is in world cultures. Music is really tied into particular social functions, and so you get a lot of meaning coming from that gathering, that context. We have this notion about absolute music. We just go sit in a concert hall. That's all there is. And that's, that's very rare in terms of musical history and musical, musical culture, um, music divorced from every other social aspect. So we, we get a lot about the meaning from music and the interpretation from the context and the, the occasion and all that. So I think, yeah, extra musical things are really critical. Uh, so how much of this is uh, hardwired versus learned? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, I, t I teach, like I said, I teach cognitive psychology of music, and so I, I give examples of musical cultures from throughout the world. And so definitely tonal systems vary quite a bit. I mean, there are some, there are universals in music, um, but these kinds of scale factors are, are quite diverse cross-culturally. So I think you know learning is going to play a very big part of it. I mean, there are certain features of music that are universal. Um, interval of the fifth is very common. Um, the fact that we use steps and we don't glide, things like that. But within within that pitch space, there's a lot of variation in how we make pitch sets and scales and, and tonal systems and different ways of creating harmony, uh, different textures, um, monophony, heterophony, whatever. So I, I would doubt that much is hardwired as far as tonality. I think we we learn it. Um, I mean, it's just a balancing act. There's a certain universal things, a tonic, fifth, and all that. But then there's lots of, lots of diversity cross-culturally and, and scale systems and, and the like. Well, I guess do, you, do you think that people with perfect pitch are more sensitive? To what? These variations in these sounds, these uh, different tempo sets. I don't, know, I don't know literature looking at musical emotion between people with or without perfect pitch. There may be studies out there. I'm not, I'm not aware of them, so um, I have a lot of friends <laughs> with perfect pitch. I don't think that they experience music uh, more deeply than I do. But, and I, I know lots of non-musicians, you know, people with no musical background who are, have very, very strong emotions. I don't, I don't think your background determines your responsiveness to, to musical sound. Particular styles, yes, but as far as just a general feeling for music, it doesn't require you know, conservatory um, training or perfect pitch. So I don't know, as far as studies about comparing Responses, I, I don't know of studies that have looked at that, so. Um, I have just a personal observation and also a question. Um, when I, I remember when I was a child, I would often get that, uh, the minor key Beethoven in my head a lot when I was upset. And this, it's this one? Yeah, okay. the one you played. And um, it still happens whenever uh, my mind starts racing or I get very upset about something or feel stressed out, I notice it'll pop in immediately over and over again. I've heard it called earworms, those mm. things which come, but it's, it's quite constant for me. And that's how it's a, it's a cognitive trigger for me to realize, oh, I'm upset. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Beethoven. So um, the other, that was an observation, the, the question is, um, I wonder, or rather it's a hypothesis, I wonder if people seek out certain kinds of music that are correlated with, you know, tranquil, sweet, or tragic, fearful, or happy, heroic, because that's how they're already feeling. They don't want to feel alone. Okay, so I anticipated your question. Ah. So I brought a slide just to answer it, because I knew someone was going to ask that question. Thank okay. you. So, yes. So typically we make a distinction between, we can call them homeopathic and allopathic. I just take this from, from medicine. And so the homeopathic use, you just made allusion to this, is treating like with like. So if you're really in a bad mood, play something which is really dark and depressing and, and you know, angst-filled. 
Allopathic is treating like with its contrary. That means if you're really upset, play something very pleasant and happy and relaxing. So if you talk to people, they kind of do both things at different times. Sometimes when you're really angry, you want to hear an angry piece. A, a happy piece makes you even angrier. <laughs> Other times, you just need, you, you need something very relaxing and soothing. And so we can talk about this. Actually, in the book, um, we, I talk about this homeopathic versus allopathic uses of music. And so people treat themselves both ways. Sometimes, like I said, sometimes they treat anxiety with anxiety sounding music. Other times it's with the opposite, with something very soothing and relaxing. So people do both and, and uh, they seem to be effective in different ways for different people in different contexts. Is that what you're getting at? No, no, but go ahead. I want to hear your hypothesis. So if you're feeling sad, you want to hear sad sounding music to overcome, to reinforce it or? or I was assuming it would treat it because uh, it w it w one would be reminded, oh, I'm not the only one. Because <laughs> there's so much that goes along with emotion, uh, what sort of concretizes it and keeps it there is thinking I'm all alone with this or there's something wrong with the fact that I'm feeling this way. So being reminded. Through the composer, you mean, or through the? Through the, the whatever the music represents okay. is a reminder. So that was a, a specific hypothesis around the homeopathic okay. use. Have there been any studies on chemical changes in the brain uh, through scans or through uh, other modes of, of, of testing to, to see when people listen to music, what happens in different areas of the brain? Okay. So, um, the first part of your question was about chemical Chemical changes. Chemical changes yeah. in the brain that might, may occur when, by stimulation. Through I don't know about studies that have looked at chemical changes. So the technique called PET, or positron emission tomography, yeah. can look for changes yeah. in receptor binding. Right. I don't know of any studies that have done that for music. But there's a lot of stuff, uh, non-chemical methods, looking at brain activation when people listen to music, which they, they like. Mm -hmm. And so or when, when people get chills when they listen to music. And so, yeah, I mean, so the story for that is that there seems to be sort of parts of the brain that are active when you like something. So I talked about these aesthetic emotions. In terms of the brain, they seem to be kind of generic. And so kind of the same general part, it's called orbital frontal cortex, is activated when you listen to music you like, um, eat chocolate, watch pornographic films. Uh, no, I mean, it's like there's kind of like, I don't want to say a pleasure center, but kind of an aesthetic center that gets stimulated by all different kinds of sensory modalities. So if you look at studies on s sniffing pleasant uh, odors and tasting pleasant foods and classical music or music you like, they all seem to be directed towards the same general part of the brain, this orbital frontal cortex involved in aesthetic appraisals of, of objects. And so, so this core Ortney th story, I didn't, I didn't talk about it neurally, but actually fits in very nicely with neuroscience data. And so having three different foci kind of fits in with sort of three brain areas that may be specialized for, on the one hand, motivational things versus aesthetic things versus uh, moral, moral social appraisals. So I didn't talk about that today, but there's actually a, a pretty good correlation between these cognitive foci and then brain areas that seem to be specialized for those different kinds of appraisals. In the back. A couple of questions from a composition point of view, if you're uh -oh. writing a piece of music, <coughs> yeah. um, knowing or based upon your hypothesis here, if you want to induce or want to trigger an emotion in your audience, um, do you write the piece in a, in a major key if you want them to be happy? Do you write in a minor key or a, a suspended you know, are, are you a composer yourself? Well, I'm a musician. Do we have one in the audience? I mean, um, <clears throat> I, and I the, the second part of that question is, what are the implications of your findings for music therapy? Um, so those are two very different questions. Let me, let me do the second one first, because there's been so much stuff, I think, also in this country, but elsewhere about the Mozart effects and things like that. I, I think the bottom line for music therapy, because I've done some consulting on, on dementia studies, is that you have to use music that people have some kind of connection with, music that they like. And so there's no all-purpose musical elixir, Mozart or otherwise. I mean, I happen to not like Mozart so much, so it wouldn't work for me if I was in some kind of, you know, home for the elderly kind of thing. And so, I mean, I have friends who do sort of cross-cultural music therapy, and so if they're working with um, Iranian immigrants, they have to find music, have, you know, for music therapy, you have to find music that comes from their culture, that appeals to them. So. This whole thing about there's a general purpose musical elixir and it's Mozart or anything else is totally wrong. And so for music therapy, you've got to, 
play with these aesthetic emotions and play with people's social context, the things you mentioned, and, and find ways to play into their taste and things that are meaningful for them. So there's no, you know, like I said, all-purpose cure-all for music. Then the first part was about composers. Um, I assume that composers do want to elicit uh, responses in their listeners, and they do play with a lot of conventional things, like these conventional harmonic things, and then surprise and, and things that are unexpected, and you talked about the expectation and all that. So some kind of balance between things that are conventional enough that mean things to people from your culture, and then enough surprises to make it not seem too conventional and just a repetition of something done before. So I guess it has to be a balancing act. I mean, so who mentioned Schoenberg? Somebody mentioned Schoenberg. Okay, so he had to form the, a private society, you know, basically in his living room because nobody really liked his music at the time. And so he had to have kind of a, a little gathering just of those few people at the time who, so, you know, he had this private s s performance society, I forget the name of it. And so you have to kind of walk the line between having some kind of mass appeal and sort of having your voice as a composer. So, I, but I can't speak from it as, as a composer, just uh, I assume that's the case. That, I, oh, sorry. Actually, my question has to do with that, whether you've asked any composers when they're, um, for example, you dealt in the, uh, with Bernard Herrmann. Yeah. He had to understand what Hitchcock wanted in order to compose that music. And the question I would have to hit the composer is, are you searching for that true emotion? And how do you know when you've got it? Or do you have to have a sitting, like the Schoenberg sittings, where you have knowledgeable friends who can respond. Uh, you, in other words, when the composer is writing, um, what, is, wh when he, what he hears in his head, is it, it has to, well, it has to be true to his, what he thinks is his emotion, but he's still not sure what the listener will. But I mean, in, in the case of a film, compared to, say, Schoenberg, just composing abstract music for a concert setting. Here there's a really nice, there's, there's a, a very strong narrative element here. So he's trying to make music that's going to fit a particular narrative. There are many, many ways of creating music for those scenes. He picked a very, a very nice one, I think. But I mean, so for him, he has a very strong, you know, road map there because he has to write music for the scene in the restaurant and then the scene in the flower shop and all that. So it's not just gonna be some abstract thing coming out of his head. He has to make a pretty good match between the emotions that are conveyed in the scene and the emotions in the music. So, and many times it doesn't work. You hear film music that just you think it's not appropriate or it's not whatever. He happened to be very good, and, and he uses all the idioms of you know late 19th century, early 20. You talk about Schoenberg. I mean, he follows all those conventions. It's very, it's very Debussy-esque. I mean, the kinds of tonality he's using. So he's borrowing lots and lots from concert music to make this kind of, of film score. Um, but again, so it's not just abstract stuff. He has something there that he has to write music for. And that thing came before his music. He writes music to it. That may hit the truer emotion, I think, is what I'm getting to. Um, for example, Bach. In St. Matthew Passion, there are passages which um, induce a very intense emotion, at least for me. And the content is um, very specific. We know what that content is. Um, is it because he's a better, greater composer that he gets to the heart of that emotion? Um, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like my, my comment about the Iranian immigrants. I mean, it's, re okay. it's really personalized. And so, you know, Bach works for you and not for other people. And he was obviously a very skilled composer, and, and there's no question about that. But it all comes down to taste and, and you know, even among, like, I, I'm a classical music person, but there are many things that I don't like that most classical music fans do like. And so everybody has their own taste, and, and it, it varies quite a bit. And many, many skilled composers out there, and, and some work for me, some work for you, and, and yeah. Uh, you think that the Boston scene, what about someone like Jan and Bernie? <laughs> 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 no, but uh, the comment was, was totally general. It wasn't about any one person's music or one use. It was just generically that if you, if you forget about concerts, music for its own sake, absolute music, then most music has an association with some kind of context. Like the example I gave was, you know, all these neo-Nazi things, you know, get rid of these people and all that. It could be something more socially positive, like the music therapy thing. But in general, music has a connection with other things in society and reinforces those messages. And those composers are trying to, f I mean, you see it all the time, like this very schmaltzy, happy music when it's a, a scene which is supposed to be socially positive and recovering from the operation and all that kind of stuff. I mean, all these conventions, and they've been used for, you know, since the age of film music when you had really, you know, 
pianist or organist improvising, and there were these conventions for the storm scene and for the love scene, and you find it from opera for many centuries and, and all that. So, um, no, music is, is there to kind of do other things and re reinforce other kinds of messages, except now we have concerts where we just go and listen to music and that's it. But that's not, that's not the norm, either historically or cross-culturally, that, that's, not, that's not the norm. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm, 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 this whole context has made me feel somewhat uncomfortable, and I think it's maybe I, I, I can try to articulate why. And I think it's because there's sort of an underlying contradiction. Um, I'm not going to be able to really slam it, but, but maybe I can try and get at it. And it goes something like this. You've, you seem to be arguing fairly strongly that the emotional relationship between music, music and emotion is purely conventional. It's, it's not innate, it's just, you know, it's whatever we happen to learn as a result of our, what we hear all the time or the culture we grew up in and all that kind of stuff. I, I think I'm not really misrepresenting you, well, at least not, not grossly. It, it wasn't yet. part of my talk. I kind of addressed the question that way. I wasn't trying to make a strong point about the fact no, that you weren't. universals and all that. Yeah, but, I, uh, I, may, I may be stretching. Maybe uh, can you tell me if I'm stretching things. So if that was really true, then there, then music really wouldn't ever change, would it? Because the best, motion, best emotional music would just play on the conventions that we've already learned. But those but, conventions but vary strikingly cross-culturally and historically. I, uh, but so with it, no, uh, right, cross-culturally would, there would be innovation, but in a particular culture, for example, in Western classical music, there would never be any innovation. There, there wouldn't be, there shouldn't be, Okay. If your theory is right. I, I, no, but I wasn't making the argument against innovation <laughs> at all. I hope I, <laughs> I know I didn't, you don't. I, I didn't come I, across that's that. That's what way. I mean. I, you, you don't want to make that claim. No, there's cultural evolution of music uh, every, every generation. And when a composer is something, that, and this relates to other questions, when a composer sits down to write a piece of music, certainly the great composers, innovation was, was, was something that was very much at the forefront of what they were trying, but trying to I, achieve. And Beethoven yeah. comes to mind, and, and but his string quartet. If I can get you out of Beethoven example. and go go to a church, for example, if you look at religious music, you don't want to have a lot of innovations. I mean, those That's things right. are very conservative because they're very important. That's Beethoven, right. you, we don't care so much about concert music. It doesn't really affect our survival nearly as much as things that are ritual and ceremonial. So if you look at music of the Australian Aborigines, every recording I have sounds exactly the same because they don't believe in having a lot of change. They don't want uh, the new version of their of their song. They want the same old version that's been around for maybe thousands of years. So yeah, I mean, Beethoven's a bit freer to, Beethoven's kind of music is a bit freer to change. But think about music, say more ancestrally, like religious music. You don't want just the top 40 kind of changes to the songs. You want those same old hymns and tunes that have been around for generations. And so there are kinds of music that you do want to grow and change. Other kinds of music, you want to be very conservative and be kind of the you know, cornerstone of your, of your musical society. So what society. happens if I articulate what you just, by, just said by saying the following? Music that is a prostitute is music that doesn't want to change, but there's some other kind of no. music that doesn't prostitute <laughs> <laughs> that you haven't talked about yet. No, I think it applies to all, to all musics. I mean, there's a tendency for things to change you know, with new generations. Some are more resistant to change, especially in a more religious or ritual context. Others, because they have less connection with survival, whatever, they're more part of, say, pleasure or re recreation. Yeah, they, oh. I didn't see it. I didn't see it. Okay. Um, they, can, they can change more, more freely. But there are, other, there are certain songs that we have a very strong attachment to. We don't want them to change. Um, others change weekly, it seems. You know, like in pop culture, there's new movements every, every, every few months. So, yeah. No, I, I, no it's funny. Even, even when I don't talk about musical emotion in my talks, it always comes, it gets to this. So I thought, well, okay, just give a talk about this because, so it's good. There's so many questions, but it always comes down to something about wh why do I feel the way I do when I, when I listen to music? And so people always want to know about that. So I tried to give some, some take on what might be going on um, in terms of how music does what it does. So are we out of time? Yep. Okay. <laughs>
classical music is used to um, quell crime. We'll talk about what they do in train stations and all that kind of stuff. So that's where we'll really get into all this kind of stuff. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.